Assalamualaikum everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Kailash Chandwani. I'm an anesthesiologist and interventional pain management physician working in North Carolina, USA. It's an honor and privilege to speak with you today about chronic pain. So let's jump in. Um, disclaimer, I have nothing to disclose. This is the objective of my talk and the listener should be able to describe common types of the pain at the end of the talk, review the pain transmission pathway, understand the process of sensitization, list common pain medication and their mode of action, review common treatment strategies in chronic pain and conclusion. So let's just start with the definition. We need to understand between the difference between nociception and the pain. So nociception is an electric signal or message that is generated in response to the electric painful stimulus that travels to the brain and all the process in between. Actually, it's just data. However, the pain is the interpretation of that data. That helps us to perceive the pain. And by the definition of the pain by International Association of Study for Pain is defined as unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. So it has an emotional aspect. We get angry or upset when we get the pain. Also, there is a, um, the second aspect that described in terms of such damage. That means something is bad going on. Even if there is nothing damage is going on, we still feel the pain. Based on the duration, pain is divided into uh, acute and chronic pain. Acute lasts less than three months, while chronic lasts over three to six months. Acute pain has obvious source of ongoing damage while chronic pain has no source of ongoing damage. Acute pain typically results upon healing of initiating injury, while the chronic pain persists beyond the expected duration of healing. And acute pain serves protective function, while chronic pain has no protective function. It's like a false fire alarm in our, our house. So chronic pain lasting longer than three months doesn't go away and has many downstream side effects interrupt our day-to-day -day routines. Based on etiology, the pain is divide, um, has two distinct types, nociceptive and neuropathic pain. The nociceptive pain refers to the activation of nociceptors that includes tissue damage, pressure, and inflammation. The common examples are arthritic, muscular, surgical pain, maybe visceral, dis described as aching, while the neuropathic pain refers to the primary lesion or dysfunction in the nervous system. Uh, common examples are sciatica, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, uh, complex regional pain syndrome, described, generally described as stabbing, burning pins and needles, shooting, jabbing sensation. Why do we discuss about the chronic pain? It's a serious public health issue and um, more people are affected, in, at least in the Western world, more people are affected with the chronic pain than the heart disease, diabetes, other chronic conditions combined. It has astounding healthcare uh, economic burden in terms of healthcare cost and the loss of productivity, and 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 the, and we don't have an adequate understanding about the pain, and we don't provide any adequate treatment. And part of the reason we don't have adequate understanding that it's very complex. I wish we wish it could have been as simple as that. What is depicted in the picture with this with the single uh, fiber transmitting the pain signals all, all the way to the brain, but that's not so. That's a schematic drawing of the pain transmission and perception. So from the periphery via the peripheral nerve into the spinal cord, up the spinal cord into the brain, and then there is a descending uh, influence from the brain and higher centers. We see that there are commonly um, factor, commonly overlooked factors which can influence the perception of pain are the psychological factor and so social factors which can amplify the pain and that needs to be addressed while treating the chronic pain. So the pain, um, this is the most fascinating uh, aspect of the pain management, the pain transmission pathways. There are four distinct step, steps in the pain transmission. Transduction, trans mission, modulation, and perception. So what's transduction? It's a conversion of noxious stimuli to an electric impulse. So that's the first step whereby out, um, external painful stimulus make, it, make a way to the spinal cord. 
That's the cartoon which show, shows how the external stimulus in the form of heat mechanical and chemical stimulus is converted into the uh, depolarizing currents, which is uh, generating the action potential that travels to the spinal cord from the peripheral nerve receptors via the voltage gated sodium channels. And the receptors, as we, can, as we know from our anatomy days of the anatomy, that receptors are specialized nerve endings generally. With the exception, with the exception of the pain fibers who have no specialized nerve endings, they are actually the free nerve endings, which you can see on the right side of the di uh, picture, type C and A delta fibers, they are the free nerve endings. So let's move to the transmission part. That literally means the transmission of electric impulses um, via the nerves and up the spinal cord to the brain. Uh, they are communicated across the neurons. These impulses are communicated across the neurons using different uh, excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. The excitatory neurotransmitters are glutamate and substance P, and important inhibitory neurotransmitters are glycine and GABA. There are two distinct primary efferent fibers, type A delta and type C fibers, which transmit the painful or nociceptive impulse from activated receptors to the CNS. With your cell, bo cell bodies residing in dorsal root ganglion for the body and trigeminal ganglion for head and face. So there are two uh, efferents, type A delta and type C. Type A delta is relatively larger, myelinated, and faster conducting. And as we know, the speed has to do with diameter and the myelination. While the type C fiber is a smaller, unmyelinated, slow conducting. Um, Type A delta generally produce sharp, well-localized pain because they are faster acting, while the type C fibers produce burning, slow burning, poorly localized pain because they are slower to come on. This is a schematic drawing where the, these primary efferent fibers end up in the spinal cord. They end up what we call rexid lamina one, two, and five of the dorsal horn. That is based on the anatomical cross-section of the spinal cord generally divided into 10 laminas and the one two five is the main lamina where the primary afferents meet uh, end up and snaps with a second order neuron that's the another schematic picture showing the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and how these pain fibers type a delta and c fibers end up in one two and five Second order neuron, they are generally, uh, there are two types of neurons. One is the nociceptive neuron, the other one is a white dynamic neuron. The nociceptive are specific for the nociceptive input via the type A delta and type C fiber. Um, while the white dynamic neuron, they also receive the non nociceptive information besides the nociceptive input. And they also receive the type A beta input in addition to type. A delta and type C fibers. These are the very important neurons, the wide dynamic neuron, which undergoes the modulation and central sensitization, which is something we're going to discuss later. Um, uh, the transmission pathways as they move up to the thalamus and the spinal uh, to the brain, and there are two non overlapping pathways, ascending pathways. One is the lateral, the other one is the medial pain pathways. The lateral is the most important pathway in the form of lateral spinal thalamic tract. It's a simple pathway, have a few synapses. It runs typically on the one side unilaterally and it provides um, the discriminative information about the pain, such as intensity, location, and quality of pain. While the medial pain pathway system is very complex, multi-synaptic, typically it runs bilaterally and provides emotional, cognitive, autonomic response to the pain. So the lateral pain, pain pathway, as you can see, starting from the peripheral nociceptors up through the nerve, dorsal root ganglia, snapsing in the one to five lamina of the dorsal horn. It crosses over what we call decussette to the opposite side and travels up as a lateral spinal thalamic tract. Medial pain pathways, and that, um, arises either the direct projection or the rich network of the collaterals that end up in the midline structures such as midline brainstem, hypothalamus, amygdala, medial thalamus, limbic structures which are associated with the emotional component of the pain. So from this 
and with the help of tract, uh, they end up in the three neurons. Uh, it's very important to know that medial pathways go, uh, and for medial pathways, the medial part of the thalamus is involved. The transmission continues to the somatosensory cortex from tertiary neurons in the thalamus for the perception and responding to the situation. There's a visceral sensation. They also have a primary afferents, which also synapse in the dorsal horn. However, they are different from the somatic afferents. Usually they are silent and and this, the brain interpret these signals, the visceral signals, as if they are coming from the somatic primary afferents within the same part of the body. That's what we call referred pain. The famous example is the anginal pain ref, being referred to the left shoulder and the arm, and the intestinal pain such as appendicitis being referred to the skin. Interestingly, it appears to be a one-way pathway that means it travels from visceral to somatic, not from somatic to visceral, uh, uh, other way around. So let's move to the another step in the pain transmission, which is called modulation. So the modulation refers to the modification of ascending nociceptive input, either by inhibitory or excitatory input at all levels. In the normal circumstances, what we call physiological pain response, there is a net inhibition of nociceptive input before relaying to the brain for the perception. While in, a, in an abnormal situation, such as pathologic pain response, there is a net facilitation of the nociceptive input before relaying to the brain. That's what we call sensitization. The concept of modulation bring us an excitatory, uh, excuse me, and fascinating uh, uh, specialty in the uh, area in the chronic pain management. That's what we call neuromodulation. And what it refers to, it actually refers to the application of either exogenous chemical agents in the form of medication or electric stimulation to a specific neural target to enhance this neuromodulation in order to modulate the perception of the pain. Modulation may happen anywhere, but supraspinally brain stem is the major source of the input driving this descending neuromodulation. There is an area called periaqueductal gray area, which is the key area in the midbrain of the brain stem that receives the stimulation from cerebral cortex or spinal thalamic tract via medial pain pathway system, as we discussed before. Later on, they, uh, it activates the, the locus cerulus with, uh, in the pons, which is primarily noradrenergic area, and then it activates the locus raphe magnus in the medulla, which is which is predominantly ser serotonergic. And thereafter, they send the descending information down to the um, site of the synapse via the local inhibitory neuron to modulate the pain transmission. So this is the schematic drawing on the left side. You see the midbrain, pons, medulla, and spinal cord. That's the area, periaqueductal gray area activate the nuclei of the locus uh, cerulis in the pons and activating locus um, raphe magnus in the medulla and later on they descend and send the descending information down to the spinal cord at the site of the synapse. You can see all these areas involves the opioid receptors and endogenous um, opioid system. Modulation at the spinal level, it happens through the influence of the primary afferents on local interneural circuit. That is the basis of the famous and landmark theory called gate control theory of the pain, which was proposed by the psychologist and neuroscientist Malzik and Wall in 1965. What it refers to, it is the interaction of the two different neurons that modulates the perception of the pain. What it means that as you see in the top part of the panel, do you see the type C fibers, which are the primary nociceptive input? They, they uh, activate a second order neuron and, the, and they transmit the strong impulses. However, in the presence of non-nociceptive input, that is a one type of neuron via, via the activation of A beta fibers, it overwhelms the second order neuron via the inhibitory neuron it overwhelms the second order neuron, thereby it inhibits or closes its gate 
to the incoming pain signals via the type C fibers, thereby slowing the pain signals. It sort of created a traffic jam here and inhibiting the input from the type C or the pain fibers. So important neurotransmitters involved in the modulation are the norepinephrine, serotonin, and enkephalin, which are the part of the endogenous opioids from descending inhibitory modulation, glycine and GABA from inhibitory interneurons, and glutamates and substance B from primary efferents. There's another schematic drawing. It shows how the spinal and supraspinal mechanisms uh, influence or modulate the pain transmission at the site of the synapse. In the center, you see that primary A delta and type C fiber synapse to the second order neuron at the site of the synapse. And you see on the right side, supraspinal mechanisms and on the left side, spinal mechanism influence the transmission of pain or we call modulate the, modulate the pain. So supraspinal through locus cerulis and, and locus raphe magnus uh, from the brain stem via the, uh, via the intermediate, uh, excuse me, via the inhibitory interneuron. On the spinal side, it's the type A beta fibers invoking the, uh, actually it's a gate theory of the pain, um, inhibiting the incoming impulses from the I, uh, A delta and type C fibers. So actually this is the basis of why we feel good when we have a pain in our arm or leg, when we rub and shake, because we are actually uh, stimulating type A beta fibers through the touch that inhibits the incoming pain signals from A delta and C fibers. So the final step is the perception. Uh, that's the conscious awareness of the discomfort, which is a higher order complex process of the brain. And that's a net, net sum of the discriminative, emotional, modulatory, endocrine, and motor aspect of the pain. So this is the drawing. We're showing the lateral pain pathways um, going through the lateral part of the thalamus into the somatosensory cortex and the medial pain pathways going through the midbrain. I mean, brain stem, medial part of the thalamus to the limbic structures. Usually the medial pathways are the bilateral and the lateral pain, pain pathways are the unilateral. Another schematic drawing the, on the top part is a lateral pain pathway. This is also known as neospinothalamic tract. While lateral thalamus to somatosensory cortex, we feel, and this is a discriminative component, that is we feel intensity and location of the pain while the medial pain pathways goes through the brain stem, medial thalamus, and the limbic cortex for the emotional aspect. Sensitizing, this is very fascinating um, topic in the chronic pain management. What does it mean that? It means it's a heightened level of response to every other stimulus due to pers persistent noxious stimulus or trafficking. In the normal circumstances, every other stimulus evokes the same amount of the response. However, when it becomes pathologic, it becomes more painful every other stimulus. It, this is as a result of structural and functional changes and CN is known as neuroplasticity. That's how the human body is evolved. It, it can happen peripherally and centrally peripherally. It can happen as a result of tissue trauma, which results in activation and sensitization of neuro, no, nociceptors as a result of lowering of the threshold potential, which results in increased firing rate and action potential. And if it is nerve trauma as a, uh, as a stimulus, it results in three distinct steps. Ectopic activity, which is due to altered sodium channel expression, either on the severe nerve or on results in a receptive field expansion. And third one is a sympathetic sprouting to the injured nerve that is aberrant connection of sympathetic nerve system. Sometimes we do a sympathetic block to help with that certain kind of a neuropathic pain. Central sensitization, it can follow both persistent nociceptive input or neuropathic pain. It is characterized by what we call the wind-up phenomena, which is nothing but enhanced response to subsequent stimulus resulting in hyperalgesia. Also, there is a receptive field expansion. What it happens, um, the non-nociceptive input from non-injured neighboring area via the touch through the type A beta fibers, um, 
it stimulates somehow it uh, make an aberrant connection or sprout to the second order dorsal horn neuron at the site of the injury. So the touch results, so the non-painful stimulus causes the pain, which is what we call allodynia. But also there is increase in area of uh, the painful field. The other uh, parts of the central sensitization is enhanced synaptic transmission at the site of the synapse. There's a loss of local inhibitory control, which is nothing, which is nothing but the reverse of the gate control. There is upregulation of postsynaptic glutamate, which is a excitatory neuro, uh, neurotransmitter receptors, especially NMD receptor, which we uh, discussed later. And there is in in bottom line is the shift of descending net inhibition to net excitation, and we we feel more pain. That is the cartoon how, how the central sensitization happened. This is the site of the snaps. What you are seeing there is an arrival of depolarizing current at the central part of the primary afferent at the site of the snaps. There is action potential that activates the voltage gated calcium channels at the presynaptic membrane that causes the mobilization of vesicles here and containing the major neurotransmitter known as glutamate and that is the, causes the release of the glutamate into the into the synaptic cleft and it activates both kind of receptors glutamate receptor one is the a AMPA receptor the other one is the NMD receptor the NMD receptor usually stays silent in acute situation, however, AMP receptor gets activated, causes the depolarizing current, and action potential is generated. However, uh, repetitive AMP receptor stimulation in the presence of repetitive nociceptive stimulus and trafficking can result in activation of NMD receptor by popping off the magnesium, which was stabilizing the NMD receptor. Now, NMD receptor become activated. That result in the sequence of events which will eventually lead to the central sensitization so bottom line is nmd receptor is the key receptor or is it a gateway to the the whole world of central sensitization another cartoon showing the a beta fibers and type c fibers in normal uh, uh, normal physiological response the type c fibers Coming, activating the second order neuron with no interaction with the type A beta fibers at the, at the second order neuron level. However, with the pathologic response, they somehow make the aberrant connection and sprout into the dorsal horn, the second order neuron or the dorsal horn, thereby activating the pain sensation via the touch. This is what we call allodynia. This is the classic example of plastic changes the structural changes in the nervous system. So based on what we have learned so far, we should be able to explain why the patient whose X-ray of the head is going to be shown now, why is he insensitive to pain? Well, of course, there is no brain, there is no perception. So no matter what the pain transmission is, if we don't have ability to perceive the pain, we're not going to feel the pain. That's an interest, and that's actually the essence of the definition of pain, which reflects the perceptual state. So there is an interesting concept when the when we blunt the perception under the general anesthesia, we should not forget about treating the pain in response to the surgical stimulus because there is the ongoing pain transmission from the surgical stimulus, and they can result in oversensitization, overexcitation through the NMD receptor, at least at the spinal level, if we don't treat them. So there is always a benefit of preemptive analgesia that I means starting with the medication before the pain kick in, starting with the regional anesthesia, such as peripheral nerve block or spinal anesthesia, before the pain kicks in to reduce or stop those sequence of events that may eventually lead to the sens central sensitization and increase amount of a pain. So these are the common pain medications which we use in a pain path, in a pain management in relation to the pain transmission pathways. So at the periphery, at the level of the receptors, when there is a tissue trauma, there are inflammatory mediators that causes a sensitization or activation of nociceptors. 
the medication working at this level at the periphery are the NSAIDs, which are non steroidal anti inflammatory medications such as ibuprofen to reduce uh, via cyclooxygenase pathway, reduce the uh, formation of the inflammatory mediators. And also we can use the peripheral nerve block using local anesthetic to reduce the pain transmission at the periphery level. Once the, uh, once, uh, the action potential reaches to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, again, there is, we can use the local anesthetic to, uh, to cause the conduction blockage in the form of spinal anesthesia. Um, there are the opioids, which is more commonly used in the Western world, such as pethidine, morphine, and other synthetic opioids. It works in everywhere in the central nervous system. Here at the spinal side, at the side of the synapse, they work at the presynaptically and postsynaptically to reduce the release of the neurotransmitter and also sensitization of uh, postsynaptic membrane. It can work through the brain stem to enhance the descending neuro inhibition also. As we know from the anatomy days, there are, there are opioid receptors densely located in the layer one and two of the rexid lamina, which are also known as a marginal layer or substantia gelatinosa. There is alpha two delta unit of the voltage gated calcium channel, and the gabapentinoids are a special group of the medication, which include gabapentin and pregabalin. It modulates the calcium channel and reduces the um, release of the neurotransmitter. However, they are not the calcium channel blocker, but they are the modulator working through the alpha to delta unit of these channels. There is a, a special drug called ziconitide approved in the United States only for intrathecal and trispinal use, working on the calcium channel. They work as a calcium channel blocker because these channels are densely located in the central nervous system. So there is a growing interest in the ketamine use in America, especially. So ketamine is a PCP derivative. It's a drug, PCP fencyclidin, that's a derivative of it. Because of the growing public health crisis, deadly crisis of opioid overutilization in America, there is always a desire to come up with a drug which can work as an opioid sparing agent. It has a full spectrum of analgesic and anesthetic benefit in a dose-dependent fashion, in a low dose, what we call a subhypnotic dose. It can, use, it can be used as acute pain management, providing opioid sparing agent, and also to prevent the chronification of pain. And in a chronic pain, it can reduce the central center sensitization and restore the pain pathways. It works primarily through the NMDA antagonism. You remember that how, that's how it leads to the central sensitization. The other mechanism could be antidepressant, or it may enhance a descending inhibition, or it may work on the mu receptors. In the area of the midbrain, there are opioids and endogenous opioids involved at every level of the uh, brain stem. There's noradrenaline in the, in the area of the pons and serotonin in the medulla. We can use the medication to enhance these neuromodulation and alter the perception of the pain, such as tricyclic antidepressants, which work as a reuptake inhibitor of these hormones, as we discussed. There's another group of medication called serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SNRI, such as deloxidin and valdifixin. Uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor can be used, but less effective than other group of the medication. There's a mixed group of medication called tramadol, which is a weak mu agonist, but it, uh, it works, it has also SNRI-like action and alpha-2 agonists such as clonidine, which increases the concentration of nor nor norepinephrine and can enhance the neuromodulation. One of the drugs which has always got us intrigued is called acetaminophen or paracetamol. We don't know where it works. It works centrally and causes, uh, and results in analgesia. So the common pain presentation and treatment strategies in the pain management, back or spine pain is one of the top leading presentation. Almost everyone in a once in a lifetime will have a one episode of back pain. One third of these back pain can result in a chronic back pain. And it is a tremendous economic burden in terms of healthcare cost utilization. 
generally spine and spine has a four structure cervical or neck thoracic and mid back lumbar or low back at the sacrum or the tailbone and they are made up of individual bones called vertebral bodies which are stacked on the top of each other making a spinal corner column in the center is the spinal canal which has the spinal cord in the center and each vertebral body excuse me um, there are the side holes in the spinal column through which the branches of the spinal cord comes out as a nerves. The case one presentation, think about a younger patient who have a long story of back pain, certainly has exacerbation of the back pain resulting in radiating pain and dermatomal distribution. Sitting, standing, bending, lifting increases pain, repositioning, to, uh, repositioning helps his pain. That's what we are talking about, the disc herniation, as you can see, irritating the nerve root, causing the radiating pain or sciatica. The second case presentation, elderly gentleman with the intermittent episodes of low back pain, once in a while get the exacerbation of the pain and weakness, also described as a pins and needle sensation, referred pain into the bilateral lower extremities, described as a, described the pain, weakness, and numbness, which gets worse on standing and walking. That's what we call neurogenic claudication, and the pain, weakness, and heaviness gets better when they lean onto something or bend down at the waist. So the, this is a classic example: bend over while walking. That's called shopping cart sand. That relieves their discomfort actually, and rarely it leads to the bladder bowel dysfunction. That's what we are talking about: the lumbar spinal stenosis, which has a typical gait. They walk with a flex forward posture, not like a normal upright position. This posture helps them to relieve their discomfort. So lumbar spinal stenosis refers to the narrowing in the spinal canal and its side opening. Usually it's a facet joint arthritis or disc displacement or thickening of the soft tissue, which is called ligament inflammation, which is the inside layer that results in the spinal cord. So the facet joints are the pair of the joints posteriorly at the vertebral column. So this is the structural lumbar spinal stenosis in the front, the, in the normal, in the, in the aging spine, the, 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 we see the loss of the height. This, that's called, called the degenerative disc disease. And there are the joints at the posteriorly facet joint. They start making the spurring. And also you don't see the ligament of flame, how they kind of compresses the central canal. This is another view, axial view. Vertebral body in the front, facet joints on the side, and in the center, posteriorly, there is a blue, you see in the blue, pentadial blue is a ligament of flame, which thicken and resulting in the compression of the spinal canal in the center called as spinal stenosis. That's another way of looking at spinal stenosis. So you're looking at the sagittal or lateral profile of the spinal column, spinal cord, and getting kinks from those structures resulting in a spinal stenosis or narrowing in the spine. The case three presentation is this, again an elderly gentleman. He's been complaining with steady, aching, non-radiating back pain, worse with bending, stooping, doing his house chores. He's always having trouble getting in and out of the chair after prolonged inactivity. And the discomfort is typically localized to the back pain with some referred pain into the buttocks and thighs. That's what we call osteoarthrosis, the first facet joint, which is a pair of the joints present posteriorly in the spinal column. This is the commonly overlooked cause of the back pain, mainly localized, aching discomfort. Pain is usually worse first thing in the morning, like arthritis pain, typical arthritis pain. All these presentation can be, the diagnosis may, can be made on the clinical presentation. And... MRI is the best modality of the choice to diagnose these cases. It's incumbent on us as a pain management physician to establish the concordance between clinical and radiological findings and also to plan the intervention safely based on the findings. As we all know, disc herniation results in a two-third of the cases. That's the natural prognosis. Spinal stenosis is a slow progressive condition, self-limiting, come and go and usually do not represent dangerous condition unless you have an exception, which includes a progressive leg weakness, loss of control of bladder bowel movements, that requires immediate medical attention. So these are some of the MRI lumbar and cervical spine. You could see the disc herniation at L5, S1. So this is the left side, and actually it's compressing the descending S1 nerve root. This is the person who 
present with a left S1 radicular with a posterior radi radiating pain all the way down to the ankle in a young patient. This is a cervical spine, 50-year-old female with a left C7 radiculopathy, which is C6, C7. You see the disc herniation off to the left and pressing on the C7 nerve root. And MRI is CT lumbar, cervical, lumbar and cervical spine for spinal stenosis. You see on the sagittal view, you see those beaking or kinks in the spinal canal. That suggests a spinal stenosis. You see the axial views. This is wide open. However, this is stenosis, stenosis, multi-level stenosis. In the cervical spine, you see there was some bone spurring coming from what we call uncinate joint, uncinate process that um, causes the narrowing in the exiting nerve root. This is the common in cervical spine. So treatment approaches, as we know, the pain is a more complicated biopsychosocial phenomenon. It's not just a body pain. So that should be treated as such based on physical, emotional, and social factors. So we cannot treat with one modality of treatment, which is, which is often ineffective. We have to use the multidisciplinary approach to the treatment of the chronic pain. So the treatment goal is not to fix it because we cannot fix it. It's not a broken bone. We have to manage it. If we cannot eliminate the pain. Sooner the better, as we said, two months versus two years and versus 20 years. 20 years is has, gonna have a least best outcomes because it becomes more of the psychosocial phenomenon than the biologic pain. And we cannot rely on the one treatment modality such as pain medicare. We have to combine different modalities to achieve better outcomes. So we require the holistic approach. Treatment goals are to get them back to their routines, daily life, and generally speaking, we work, we divide the treatment into conservative and non-conservative or surgical management. So we work our way up from medication to physical therapy or alternate three treatments to the reversible treatment, what we call pain intervention and surgical or non-conservative management is on the surgical side. Once all these options are exhausted. So, most of these conditions have a favorable clinical course, symptoms self-limiting. So the non-surgical conservative treatment is the first modality of choice. And it can may provide longer lasting pain relief in appropriate selected population, but keep in mind, it would not correct the disc herniation or spinal canal narrowing. But if your pain is manageable, doesn't need to, this condition doesn't need to be fixed or corrected surgically. And we also know the common conservative treatment. We start with appropriate medications such as NSAIDs, gabapentin, muscle relaxants, opioids, physical alternative therapies such as traction, tense unit exercises, yoga, acupuncture. We use a pain intervention in the form of epidural steroid injection and ablation. And we should use this some, some sort of behavioral therapy which kind of uh, changes the negative to the positive thought, redu reduces the impact of in, um, intensity to pain, and also improve the physical and social and functional well-being of the person. So the goal of medication is to reduce the pain, reduce the inflammation, slow down the pain signal, or inhibit the oversensitization. The epidural steroid injection, one of the most common and bread and butter procedure in the pain management, it's done under the visual guidance, which generally we use fluoroscopic, it's in the type of an X-ray and radiographic contrast medium to confirm the needle position. It reduces the inflammation, it stabilizes the nerve membranes. It's a very low risk profile, short and long term pain relief, may improve activity of daily living and may be repeated periodically. There are commonly two approaches intralaminar and translaminar approach. Intralaminar, as the name suggests, we go in between the lamina through the skin, subcutaneous tissue, supraspinal, intraspinous ligament, and ligament of flavum, and then we end up in the epidural space, as we remember from the anatomy days. The trans, this is an intralaminar approach. The transformer approach relies on a, a famous landmark in a pain management. What we do, we tilt the x-ray ipsilaterally about 25 to 30 degree. The structure you're seeing, it seems like an Scotty dog. So it is a ear, nose, it is ear, nose, leg, body. So we go under, right under the collar of that dog, which corresponds to the uh, the pedicle and just inferior to the pedicle. These are the common pictures of epidurals. On the left side is the intralaminar approach, dorsally, 
And you see the, the contrast spread is mostly in a dorsal epidural space, while in the transfer amnel, you see mostly the contrast spread is ventral. That is supposed to have the more pathology because they are closer to the disc area, and we would love to have the ventral spread of the medication. That's why the transfer hormonal is preferable over the interlaminar approach. However, these minimally invasive procedure may become potentially devastating, devastating issue. Here you see nice transfer hormonal epidural steroid injection. The contrast is traveling along the nerve route into the spine. However, we run the live, which is standard of care, live floral you see the vascular uptake, and it could be the radicular medullary arteries, which can provide the uh, um, blood supply to the spinal cord, can, can, can rarely, rarely result in a spinal cord ischemia, which is a devastating complication. So these procedures should always be done by the experienced or well-trained hands. Radiofrequency ablation, one of the other bread and butter procedure, what we do, we ablate the meter branches which arises from the dorsal rami and predominantly supplied to the facet joints. It creates the radio wave to create the heat and stun those nerves, interrupts those pain signals, can cause the pain relief for six months to one year and can be repeated after the pain returns. It's a two-step procedure. First step is the diagnostic block to establish the source of pain generated followed by, followed by um, ablation. Um, at previously identified site under X-ray guidance to provide long-term lasting pain relief. Um, the procedure is done as an outpatient same day and is a 30 minute to one hour discharge home with some pain medication for muscle discomfort. Expect normal activities the day after procedure. The equipment used in the RFA radio frequency ablation is the generator probe needle as you can see in the picture. And these are the pictures of RFA probe, RFA procedure. Differentiator, always when we are treating, especially the elder people, we always have to have a differential in our mind, such as compression fracture, hip arthritis, sacroiliac joint, peripheral vascular disease, peripheral neuropathy, metastatic tumor. Let's talk about the sympathetic block, parabodipolar sympathetic block. Anytime we are talking about sympathetic block, we always should have in mind, um, the disease condition called, known as a complex regional pain syndrome, also known as reflex sympathetic dystrophy or causalgia. Uh, type 1, which is divided into type 1 and type 2. They are specialized in inflammatory as well as neuropathic pain disorder. We know how, but we don't know why it happens. And it's mainly diagnosed as a, as a clinical diagnosis using the Budapest criteria. Journal features are, it's a continuing pain after any initiating injury which is disproportionate to the initiating injury and it spreads in a regional or distal, excuse me, regional distribution rather than dermatomal distribution. It has predominantly distal predominance. It usually happens after the fractures, orthopedic injuries or the fall. It has the, it's, it's, it's diagnosed based on sensory, motor and autonomic features such as hyperalgesia, allodynia, decreased range of motion, weakness, tremors, Swelling, autonomic features, swelling, sweating, color and temperature differences. Um, we do, we should do the other tests to rule out other condition which has similar manifestations such as orthopedic injury, cellulitis, DVD. So that is very important to rule out those conditions. This is a pictorial depiction of the complex regional pain syndrome, how it appears. Treatment is a physical therapy and occupational therapy or functional restoration. Um, the other treatments are used as an adjunct to get them through the rehabilitation. For inflammatory pain, we use NSAIDs and high dose steroids. For as a neuromodulators, we use tricyclic antidepressants, gabapentinoids, and duloxetin. For central sensitization, which is commonly uh, manifested in these conditions, you can use an ketamine as an NMD receptor antagonist to reverse the central sensitization. We can use a sympathetic block because of the sympathetic sprouting to these nerves, to these conditions. And last but not least, we can use invasive neuromodulation, what we call a spinal cord stimulation. This is the ultrasound guided picture with stellate ganglion, which is at the level of C6 anteriorly in the neck. What you are seeing is the C6 tubercle, um, sternocleidomastoid muscle. 
These are the vasculature in the neck, IJ and carotid artery. You're seeing the prevertebral fascia. Your needle should be underneath the prevertebral fascia. You see the needle. And this is the longest scaly muscle underneath the prevertebral fascia, but over the longest scaly muscle. And what you're seeing is injected of the local anesthetic to block the stellate ganglia for upper extremity cervical, uh, for upper extremity uh, complex region pain syndrome. This is another picture x ray shows anterior lateral spread of the contrast. But we, we should be very careful. This is a highly vascular structure, and we can end up in the vessel, such as this one shown, shown below, or the vertebral artery, which is very close to the anterior tubercle. And, and only a 1 cc or 1 percent lidocaine is enough to cause the deadly, potentially deadly seizures. This is the lumbar sympathetic block, which is done at the level of L3. You see the anterior lateral contrast spread where the sympathetic chain is to, that is used for the lower extremity complex regional pain syndrome. So these are the common, let's move on to the common joint injections such as shoulder, hip and knee. And these are the pictures actually taken from my textbook pain management chapter, which I co-authored. Uh, this is the subacromial bursa injection. You see the deltoid acromion process and supraspinatus muscle, deltoid muscles. And there's a space between which is a potential bursal space. Um, this is the acromioclavicular joint ejection, glenohumeral joint ejection, x-ray guided and ultrasound guided. This is a hip joint ejection, x-ray guided at the head and neck junction of the femur, or you can do the ultrasound guided. This is the knee injection. Instead of going intraarticularly, we use the suprapatellar recess. This is x-ray guided. This is ultrasound guided, which is because the suprapatellar recess, or famously known as pouch, it connects with the intraarticular space. There are some advanced intervention pain procedures we use in our day-to-day -day practice. So remember, we talked about lumbar spinal and stenosis with the narrowing the spine. These are the typically elderly people. They go through the conservative management, epidural steroid injection. If they don't do very well, then they jump to the surgical intervention or decompression. They have their own inherent risk, longer length of stay, longer recovery period, may have a complication or may not get better. So feel like we have a treatment gap from conservative to surgical treatment. The treatment can be and the gap treatment gap can be filled by a new emergent procedure, what we call percutaneous minimally invasive lumbar decompression. It's an outpatient procedure. What we do, we get the instrumentation posteriorly to the ligament of flame. Here you can see the structure and painted in the blue posteriorly and we debulk it and decompress the spinal canal. We don't touch any of the bones or the disc. It's an outpatient procedure done under light anesthesia and they can resume the activities within a few days, no downtime. So this is a typical, and these are the equipment we need during this procedure. Sculptor, ronger, and that's the procedure. This is a pre-procedure we establish. First, we establish the epidural gram, which is nothing but epidural injection with the contrast. You see this, the dye. And now you see that we, it is an interlaminar approach. So you see the yellow marks are the, inter, the lamina, and this is the desired space to be decompressed. This is the epidural gram, and you can see something is pushing against the epidural gram. It's a more flatter and thin, and that's in a shaded portion is, is a ligament of flavor. Post-procedure, you could see this. And what we are looking at, again, the lamina, what we are looking at, the thickness of the epidural gram. So you see it's, way, it's thicker than this epidural gram because of the decompression of the ligament of flavor and lessening of the pressure on this surface and also the shrinking of the ligament of flavor. So effectively decompressing the spinal canal. This is the cartoon which shows how pre and post procedure looks like. What we are trying to look at, get the epidural gram, the contrast thicker and straighter that shows indirectly decompression of the spinal canal. Another um, procedure we deal in a day-to-day -day practice is a compression fracture, which is usually an elderly population. Um, compression fracture, before we talk about compression, we need to understand the spinal column is divided into three columns based on the biomechanical 
stresses. Anterior column, which is anterior one third of the vertebral body and the disc. Then middle column, which is the posterior one third and the body of the vertebral disc. And the, posterior, and the rest is the posterior column. The compression fracture, by definition, involving the anterior one third or anterior column, they are stable injuries and we can treat it as an outpatient. And if there are more than two or two, more than two columns are injured, they are considered to be unstable and neurosurgical consultation is warranted. So there are three different kinds of, there are three types of the compression fracture. It could be osteoporotic, an elderly patient due to the weaker bones, or it could be traumatic, or it could be malignant or metastatic. Common symptoms include it, it usually has acute onset, localized, loss of height, patient have, may have a kyphotic angle, the back become rounded, and it's very difficult with the common movements, rarely cause leg or arm pain weakness. If it happened, that means they are neurologically compromised, then neurosurgical consultation is required. We start with the conservative management, such as bracing, medication, activating, modification, physical therapy. If they don't do very well within two to six weeks, we, what we call the procedure called vertebral augmentation with cement. That is, in a way, is called internal fixation or casting as we do other with other fractures. So these are the MRIs of the vertebral fracture. These are most likely the osteoporotic fractures. You see the loss of height of the vertebral body. There's a fluid sign and there's a, some push, posterior push of the vertebral body. And it's all edema. But we need to be thoughtful. Some of these fractures could be metastatic. That is that can be picked up based on the peculiar characteristic, such as here, you can see the bowing out of the posterior vertebral wall, which is pretty characteristic of the metastatic disease. You can run the MRI with and without contrast, or while doing the procedure of vertebral augmentation, we can do a biopsy. Briefly, it is, we get the instrumentation into the vertebral body through the pedicles, inflate the balloon to, to restore the height and create a vacuum, followed by the cement injection. That's how it looks like on AP view, bilateral spread of the cement. Outpatient discharge soon after the procedure. Spinal cord stimulation, that's the treatment of the chronic neuropathic pain by electric stimulation. The concept of spinal cord, this electric stimulation is not new. It was being used in ancient Greek and Romans they used to use torpedo fish or electric fish to treat chronic painful conditions such as gout and headaches. You can see that. In 1965, as we discussed before, Melzig and Wald put together the gate theory of the pain. And that was a very landmark theory that provided the foundation stone. Later on, in 1967, Dr. Norma Shield, neurosurgeon from Case Western Reserve University, implanted the first spinal cord. Uh, I'm very proud of that proud of myself um, that I did my fellowship from the Case Western Reserve the University. Um, in 1989, FDA approved implantable device for the first time. So it includes leads, battery charger, and remote control. You see the battery, leads. And for every any treatment strategy, we, you need to have a right treatment, right person, right time. The indication, the most common indication in the United States is called failed back surgery, post-laminectomy pain syndrome. That refers to the people who are still having the pain after, after the spine surgery. That could be due to the pre-existing lumbar radiculopathy. We never get better even after successful surgery or inadequate decompression surgery. Surgeon didn't do the right job. Maybe a wrong diagnosis, wrong level procedure, or there's the psychological status which needs to be addressed every time people go for the surgery. There may be other conditions such as peripheral neuropathy or complex region pain syndrome, as we discussed before, or in some individuals where surgery is not an option because of the because of the age, comorbidities, or need for extensive surgical intervention. So how it works, then you insert those leads in the spine epidural space. There is a pain signal in the red, and these leads stimulate the A beta fibers and thereby reducing the pain signals from type C fibers via gate theory of the pain and also also it enhances the descending neuromodulation via the brain stem and medial band pathways. And it's done in a two stages temporary or trial stage where you put the temporary leads 
um, it's coming out through the skin, connected to the external battery, and let the patient go home for five to seven days, try it and see if it is very effective for the pain management before we implant everything underneath the skin, which is actually an outpatient light anesthesia procedure. We insert those epidural lead percutaneously and anchor it to the uh, subcutaneous fascia. And we put the battery or implantable pulse generator generally in the right buttock area and subcutaneously about two inch incision. It's, it almost looks like a pacemaker of the spine. So these are some of the pacemakers in our daily repair. Patient has previous spine surgery, continues to have pain, their leads are going in the spine. So usually it really ends up in a lower thoracic region. There's a battery you can see in the upper buttock area. Uh, battery leads, you can see. Again, another view, patient had bad scoliosis and not a candidate for surgery, he had a neuropathic pain. We did this procedure. Another advanced pain procedure uh, is called intrathecal drug delivery system, commonly known as a pain pump that could be used for malignant and non-malignant pain. What we are doing, we are infusing the pain medication intrathecally. And, and this is only for those people who have a metastatic disease, have intolerance to the systemic pain medications such as opioids, resulting in ineffective analgesia. And the advantage of this uh, uh, modality is we are delivering very small dose of the pain medication intrathecally directly closer to the receptors in this, such as opioids or, so, or the local anesthetic closer to the substantia gelatinosa as we discussed in the dorsal horn and they have a relatively better side effect profile versus the systematic medications. These are the components, pain pump, pain programmer and PTM which is a patient therapy manager. So that device infuses the medication continuously uh, it is a reservoir, it, it comes in a 20 and 40 ml. This is a central filling port through which we fill this medication every three or six months. We take the old one out, put the new one in through the skin under sterile condition. That is the another port where you can do uh, what we call dye study to assess the integrity of the catheter if the patient pain is not relieved. And this device is help to, uh, help to pay and give the patients uh, extra dose these are the common medication can, that can be infused through intraspinal drug delivery systems. And typically it goes in a two stages, undergoes the trial, typically done in an inpatient setting. Start with this low dose of morphine combined with the bupivacaine. And what we are looking at, 50% efficacy and no side effects with an acceptable psychological evaluation before moving to the permanent implant, which is again done under light anesthesia. There is a Subcutaneous placement of reservoir or pump in the upper abdomen, and then there's a percutaneous placement of intraspinal catheter, and which is tunneled under the skin to the pump. And we do the outpatient percutaneous refills through the central filling port, six weeks to six months, depending upon the shelf life. And we can use a contrast study through the catheter access port to assess the integrity of the catheter system. Intrathecal drug delivery system is nowadays out of flavor because of the safety concern. It can potentially under overdosing and impact of dosing is much higher because it's a fraction of a dose we use compared to systematic dosing. And there is a very additional burden of management, refilling and all those things. There are much better alternatives such as medication and spinal cord stimulation which can treat for the same conditions. And there are not great reimbursement for these services. Well, in summary, chronic pain is a biopsychosocial phenomenon. It requires the teamwork of the multimodal, multimodal treatment approaches in order to achieve the better outcomes. This study or this talk is funded by Jenna Sindh Medical University, uh, Alumni Association of North America. And thank you so much for listening to the talk. Please feel free to contact me should you have any questions or concerns.